So thanks very much. Please help me welcome from Mountain View, by the way, so all the way coming to us from California, Pete Warden. Okay, let's see if I can get this uh, presenting full screen. We like to joke that we've, uh, we may be on the way to solving AI, but we haven't solved AV yet. So <laughs> wish me luck. Um, so yeah, thanks Marcel. Um, I'm Pete Warden. I'm here from the uh, TensorFlow team. Uh, and I want to show you how anybody can create their own image classifier without using any coding at all. Um, and I was really excited to be invited uh, to this event by Marcel um, because, as he said, there's so many events around the theory of um, machine learning and, you know, pushing forward the frontiers of machine learning, but it can be extremely hard to just get started um, with machine learning for solving your own tasks. So really who this talk is aimed at um, is hopefully everybody in this room um, who has some kind of problem that uh, is around image classification, um, but when you actually want to go and solve it, it can be very, very daunting to try and look at the literature, try and look at the research, and figure out just how to get started. Uh, you know, it often feels like you need to have all these years of experience just to understand all of the, um, the jargon um, and all of the obscure kind of like software package incantations and depend dependency installations um, and, you know, everything you need to do um, just to do what on the face of it feels like it should be a uh, very fundamental and straightforward task. Um, so what I'm going to be doing here is trying to walk you through what creating your own image classifier uh, in TensorFlow uh, with your own data looks like. Um, and it's a happy coincidence that that uh, nature work on um, the uh, skin cancer detection actually uh, came out recently because this is actually using the same approach of transfer learning um, and it's even using the same model, Google's Inception V3 model, that they're actually using for um, their work. Um, now, I'm not saying you're immediately going to get your own paper in Nature if you follow this tutorial, but uh, <laughs> um, maybe, who knows. Um, and uh, this is a tutorial I created um, last year. Um, we now actually have it as a code lab on the Google site, so don't worry about writing down all of the directions I'm going to walk through here. Um, this is uh, just going to be um, really a um, notes on things that you should know about while you're doing this, and to just give you the confidence that you can actually dive in um, and give this a try yourself. Um, so uh, there's the URL there, or if you just Google TensorFlow for Poets, Luckily, it's got quite good SEO, so you should be able to uh, <laughs> should be able to find it. And um, uh, you know, just in case you're feeling a bit skeptical, um, you know, there's actually some really fun examples of uh, the way that people have used this tutorial out there. Um, and for the Swiss people in the audience, I'll have to ask you to use your imagination here. But imagine that trains were sometimes late. Um, <laughs> This is a problem we face in America. Um, <laughs> and a really interesting uh, group um, uh, based in Silicon Valley, um, as a kind of a spare time fun project, uh, they've actually gone around to uh, loads of places along the Caltrain uh, commuter train line between uh, Silicon Valley and San Francisco. Uh, and they have uh, Raspberry Pis with little cameras attached um, that are actually keeping an eye out for the trains that are traveling past. Um, and they're not, uh, you know, they're just, uh, you know, normal developers. They didn't have any background in machine learning, but they had the problem that um, they could detect that something was going past the camera, 
but it was very hard to tell if it was a Caltrain commuter train or if it was a uh, truck or if it was a, um, a freight train. So they were able to um, use this tutorial to actually create their own image classifier that were able to run on each Raspberry Pi uh, to tell when a Caltrain went past and then use that information to give down to the second estimations of exactly how late um, your train uh, was going to be uh, through people's smartphones. Um, and uh, there's been a whole bunch of um, really fun uses of this. Uh, somebody has, again, with a Raspberry Pi, actually taught their um, image classifier to recognize when meter maids, the uh, people who give out parking tickets in San Francisco, they have very distinctive little uh, cars they drive around in. They taught it to recognize those and send him a text message when <laughs> one of them went past his car so he could run down and move it. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that's the most uh, societal, you know, socially useful <laughs> uh, use of this, um, but there's been some great applications as well with um, trying to show pieces of trash um, to a camera and have it actually sort those and tell you whether it should go into recycling or composting or uh, the general landfill. Um, so there's been some really uh, interesting use cases out of this, and I'm hoping uh, with this audience, uh, we'll also be able to get some, um, you know, even more um, use cases around the uh, research side. And, you know, it was partly inspired by my work with Marcel on the Plant Village um, image classification problem um, that we started collaborating on last year. So, um, what do you need to be able to do this? Uh, the nice thing about TensorFlow is that we have actually ported it to a bunch of different platforms. Um, as long as you've got a laptop that can run OS X, Windows, or Linux, which hopefully is all of them, um, <laughs> uh, you don't need any uh, GPUs, you don't need any um, special hardware to uh, run this particular tutorial. Um, and to create your own image classifier, you need to have um, some photos of the things that you want to actually classify. You need a training set. Um, and to make it as simple as possible, um, rather than having to mess around with data files, we've tried to set things up so that you label your images by putting them into um, different folders with the name of the label, um, and that that automatically gets picked up. Um, and this takes, um, you know, an hour uh, to run in total as you go through this, uh, maybe half hour if you've got a faster laptop. Um, so you don't need to uh, you know, devote too much time just to give this a try. And the tutorial itself comes with a prepackaged set of images. And this is actually how the labeling scheme is set up. So you can um, see here we have a root folder which then contains a bunch of subfolders um, and each of these subfolders uh, contains a whole bunch of images of um, the particular uh, flower type that uh, we're going to be classifying. Um, and I put these together. These were about 5,000 um, images uh, from Flickr that are Creative Commons licensed um, of the uh, different flowers. And it can be daunting sometimes if you're looking at trying to create your own data set um, because it can be hard to know where to get started. Um, I highly recommend just looking at public sources of images if you just want to kind of get a feel for uh, whether your classifier will actually work. Um, the great thing is that there's all of these, um, you know, Creative Commons licensed um, uh, sources out on Flickr and in other places where you can actually um, gather lots and lots of images of whatever it is that you want to classify, even if that doesn't end up being what you actually end up using, you can make a lot of progress just figuring out what's feasible 
um, using uh, completely public data. Um, and uh, what I've done here is I have almost a thousand photos of each type of flower. Um, that's uh, not necessarily as many as you need. Um, you can really start off with um, a surprisingly small number of photos. Um, you don't have to have you know, thousands or millions of photos to get started. You can start to get an idea of how something might work with a pretty small uh, set of photos. Um, things will get a lot better once you have more data and more photos. Uh, it's a great way to um, really improve um, your results. And actually, what we find is that improving your data is much more important than improving your models. Um, so don't worry so much about being up to date with the very, very latest kind of like ImageNet results. Um, what we find is that for practical applications, going in and trying to make sure that your data has fewer errors uh, is more representative of what you're actually seeing in your application um, and generally is much larger. Um, the larger you can get, the better. Uh, beats um, you know, all of the sort of you know, futzing around with advanced architectures and everything else. Um, but having said all that, just take whatever you've got to get started. Even with small amounts of data, uh, this approach produces surprisingly good results. And the tutorial actually has some different options in there. You can always run, as I mentioned, TensorFlow uh, natively on Windows um, or OS X. Uh, I actually like to use Docker. Uh, especially when I'm doing this tutorial in like workshops, because Python can be installed in so many different ways, um, especially on like OS X machines and Windows machines. Um, it can be really, really hard to actually just sort out all of the weird uh, dependency problems um, and you know messing around with brew on OS X and things like that can be a massive pain. So. Um, I recommend you actually go ahead with Docker because it gives you a completely clean um, environment to get started with. And even better, we actually publish um, Docker images um, with the latest uh, TensorFlow code um, up on the web. Uh, so all you have to do is actually uh, run this Docker command um, and it will pull down uh, the latest TensorFlow and put you into a uh, bash prompt uh, in an environment that's already fully set up for you, so you don't have to do any of the messing around. Um, the way I normally do this is have a folder on my native OS that actually has all of the images uh, that I care about that I then share with Docker, um, just because that then makes it a lot easier to um, uh, to deal with and to sort of um, you know mess around with the images in OS X Finder and things like that. Um, and the downside of Docker is that if you're not careful, your um, uh, your files w uh, on the Docker image will disappear when you uh, shut down Docker. So this is a way of making sure that the uh, inputs and the output uh, files are stored away for posterity. Um, and here I'm also showing you how you can download um, all of the flower photos. And then this is, uh, this is it as far as the script goes. Um, you don't have any hyperparameters to mess around with. Um, all you have to do is tell it where your uh, photos are. Um, and tell it where to output the uh, retrained graph. And what this is doing under the hood is taking Inception v3, which is um, a pretty accurate uh, uh, ImageNet image recognition model, 
which has been trained to recognize uh, the thousand classes that are defined in the ImageNet challenge uh, using over a million images as inputs. Uh, and the training process takes, you know, maybe, you know, a few days on like 50 um, GPU, uh, you know, high-end GPU machines in a distributed setting. Um, and it uses the magic of transfer learning to only retrain the very top layer just running on the CPU uh, to recognize the classes that you have actually given it. And the reason this works is that it turns out that if you've got a network that is able to recognize and distinguish between the 1,000 ImageNet classes, it's learned a lot about how to distinguish between different objects in general. And the inputs to the final layer have to be basically everything you need to know to distinguish between the 1,000 ImageNet uh, categories. So you can think about them as being kind of a description of the characteristics of an image, like everything that you would need to sort of think about uh, to be able to distinguish different objects. Um, things like, you know, is it, is it fluffy? Does it have ears? Does it have whiskers? Um, you know, I can't point to the exact, um, the exact uh, parts of the embedding that uh, point to those, but those are the kind of things that this um, embedding that's feeding into the final layer actually knows about. And if you think about that, you can imagine how those, that similar sort of description is useful not just for um, telling apart the arbitrary 1,000 labels that are in ImageNet, but can be used for things like flowers, which aren't in ImageNet at all, uh, because you can use a lot of the same markers, a lot of the same kind of semantic information there. And that's what this approach takes advantage of. And it's like uh, if you open up the retrain.py, you know, it's a few screens of Python. It's calling into TensorFlow. It's downloading the Inception v3 model. And then it's deleting the old um, top layer, the top fully connected layer that's actually doing the classification, putting in a new randomly initialized one, and then running through about 4,000 steps on the CPU to just retrain that very, very top layer. Um, so this takes about um, you know, 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how fast your uh, CPU is. Um, and then at the end of it, you've actually got this retrained graph.pb um, and the retrained labels.txt with the uh, classes that it's trained on. Uh, then you've, you can actually try testing that um, model. And uh, here's just a quick command to grab a script to run the graph and uh, to download the graph and uh, sorry, to run the graph and run it against one of the downloaded images um, and just make sure that you're actually getting uh, something that's like a daisy uh, for an image that is a daisy. Um, and because your graph is randomly trained every time, you might not get these exact values, but hopefully you'll get daisy as one of the top images. And so you've done this with the flower images. The only thing you need to change for your own images is um, make sure that you have your folders set up so that you have the different images in uh, different directories. Um, so each directory name corresponds to a label. And then use the minus minus image deer um, argument to point to the folder that you have all of your stuff in. Um, and then you go through the exact same procedure um, and you end up with a model in retrainedgraph.pb. Uh, and this is nothing special. This is just a standard TensorFlow model file. So that means that you're able to use it across the full kind of ecosystem of places where you can run um, TensorFlow. We've got uh, projects to help you run it um, as part of a web server. Uh, if you want to have a web service, like serving up your results, we have examples where you can run this locally on Android, iOS, or 
as I've mentioned, on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so you're able to use this uh, model um, in all sorts of different ways uh, once you've trained it up. So I talked a little bit about transfer learning. Um, the magic part of this, the thing that really gets me excited is you can take the hard work of solving um, one task, um, especially something that's, uh, you know, was traditionally very hard, like analyzing different image categories, and you can actually leverage all of that really hard work and those sort of, you know, hundreds of hours on super high-end GPU machines um, and use it for all sorts of different tasks. And even better, you only need a very small data set. Um, you know, you only need like hundreds of photos of each object to get some decent results rather than having to like collect a million photos um, like, we, uh, like we did uh, for ImageNet. So that means it's applicable to a lot more tasks across a lot more domains than um, if you had to have that barrier of collecting all of those different uh, images. Now, you know, as I mentioned, more data is great. Like that actually helps you really create much, much better solutions. But you can get a, a, a decent solution usually uh, just starting off with a small amount of data. And this is something that I see happening increasingly across um, many different deep learning problems. Here I've talked about uh, image recognition, but it's something that you can actually also apply to natural language processing. Like if you think about something like sentiment analysis, where you're taking a piece of text and you're trying to tell whether it's positive or negative, um, it turns out that you can actually use very similar techniques um, to tell what the political leanings of a particular piece of text are, or to try and classify that piece of text into what topic it's talking about. Um, and the same goes for audio techniques. You can actually do transfer learning on audio as well. And I'm really, really excited to see these recipes become much, much more common. Like, you don't have to know about chemistry to whip up a decent meal. Um, and at the moment, we're stuck in the stage where you have to be a chemist to know how to cook. I, you know, obviously, knowing a bit of chemistry can help you once you, uh, you know, get more advanced, but I want to be at the stage where um, anybody uh, can actually pick up the tools and start to produce uh, decent results. And it's such a powerful way for non-specialists to benefit from everything that's happening in especially deep learning right now. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll see more tutorials and more examples of this coming out. And, you know, as I mentioned, like the nature paper on skin cancer actually used uh, transfer learning. So it's not a, um, you know, it's not a cheap um, or sort of, you know, it's not a shortcut um, that's going to, like, leave you um, with poor results. It's actually a really powerful technique. Um, just a few notes as well. Uh, if you don't have enough data, but you want to artificially increase the data, there's some options in the script where you can do random cropping, scaling, rotation to effectively augment the images that you have, and make it look like there's more images, and you can sometimes create better results like that. Um, TensorFlow offers a full range of um, uh, ways of training. Um, everything from like the very cheap transfer learning I've talked about to fine tuning all layers in the network based on your data. And even if you've got, uh, you know, kind of lots of time and lots of GPUs, uh, you can retrain the whole network from scratch with a uh, recipe that you can find um, here. Uh, if you look in the uh, GitHub uh, TensorFlow models um, directory under inception. So that's it. I hope I've left you with some enthusiasm to um, give some of these techniques a try.
Um, and I was going to see if people had questions. Oh, uh, two questions. One, how does it do with multiple, uh, Im multiple types in the same image? So if you have a daisy and a sunflower in the same image. And secondly, does it output uh, accuracy statistics or, or, or ideas of how sure it is of the classification? Because that would be useful. So on the first question, um, that's, that's an interesting question. That actually gets into um, localization. Uh, you know, trying to actually break up the image into different objects um, that have uh, uh, that have portions of the image devoted to them. Uh, we do actually have an example out there um, that's doing person detection. Um, and for the interesting thing about ImageNet is uh, that it's using pictures from the web. Uh, to train, like that's where the ImageNet um, data set came from, and they all tend to be very well framed. So <laughs> when you first start trying to use ImageNet or an ImageNet-based model on something like a robot, where there's no notion of framing, uh, the results can actually be um, surprisingly bad. But what we tend to do there is look at things like um, trying to get bounding boxes around potential objects and then run something like the ImageNet classifier. So that's, that's a great question. Um, and sorry, what was the second question again? <laughs> accuracy statistics on the output. Yes, so you actually get um, results that are telling you a score for each output. Now, translating those into probabilities <laughs> Uh, is another area which is uh, surprisingly tricky once you sort of dive into it. If you just want to know kind of, hey, I think this is the top label, the scores you get out are fine. If you actually want to f try and infer statistics of probabilities based on them, then there's a whole world of kind of classification and kind of like curves of trying to figure out what the population of your data set versus your, of your training set versus the population of what you're likely to see in the actual world and Bayesian statistics that's kind of beyond my ken um, that you get into. Pete, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, there's a whole bunch of uh, image pre-processing technology around, you know, whitening stuff and all that things. In the Docker example you showed, is this already done, so can I just take arbitrary images with different contrast levels and so on and put them in, or do I have to do some alignment? No, no, you should be able to just um, take arbitrary images um, and feed them through. Um, the, there's actually some uh, options to do random brightening and um, you know, contrast and things like that in the advanced uh, like kind of data augmentation options. Um, but the nice thing is that these, uh, these networks actually tend to cope fairly well with um, you know, those sort of variations. So I actually haven't found much of a need to do that. But yeah, it's a really good question. All right, I'm sure there are many more questions. I just want to make sure we get uh, to coffee in time. Not just now, OK, we have uh, one more uh, speaker. But I just wanted to mention that Pete will be here all day. And he also said he'll come tonight to the networking yes. event. So that's your opportunity to grab him and learn everything you ever wanted to know about TensorFlow. Yes, thanks do. again very much, Pete. Yeah, thanks, Marcel. All right, let's see if this works. Let's see if this works. Let's see if this works.